In your dream, Harry Styles is singing to you mournfully. And you think he might kiss you, notes and tongue in your mouth simultaneously. You touch the sleeve of his brocade jacket, stiff with silk threads stitched into chrysanthemums. When you roll over, your half-awake brain remembers that playlist a man made for you as a joke, a playlist designed to mock your love of sappy pop salad, uh, ballads, not salads. <laughs> the Lumineers and Mumford, Vanessa Carlton and Lisa Loeb, that one song by Gord Downey about divorce and the ocean. Your alarm clock glows red, 2.36 a.m. You sit up, the speakers in your house have come on in the middle of the night and are playing sad Cindy Lauper. Outside, you hear a car door slam. He was standing outside, wasn't he, on your deck, close enough to connect to your Wi-Fi, his face lit up by his phone. Now it's culture club and you don't know if the hurt is meant for boy George or you. His face would have glowed green in the dark as he scrolled through your saved music and chose these songs, precisely these. The inside of your little house is intimate knowledge. Here he brought you coffee in the morning. He installed a dimmer for your dining room light that afterwards sparked and singed the drywall. When he pushed you face down on the bed and you crawled away crying, he ignored your texts for 18 hours and you thought it was fine, you could be done. But then he came back and you made him spaghetti and meatballs. His head hung low and you thought, okay, I guess. If he thinks about it, he will know where you are sitting right now, back against the headboard, eyes on the curtained window, listening to the wind, the traffic on Hastings, a falling dumpster lid. You listen to everything waiting for him to pound the door down, to hiss that you're a coward, to spit the words he wrote in letter after letter, to tie you to the bed with the chain he keeps in his nightstand or the sound of his car driving into the back gate over and over again. You wait, your son coughs in his sleep and that's your heart jumping. Fuck that thing, fuck your unreliable heart. An hour later, you creep to the window and pull the curtain back three inches. Everything is still, no wind, no traffic, no voices bickering in the alley behind the hotel bar. You pull the router from the wall and there is no electric hum now either. You haven't seen this man in five months, but he may as well be in the room whispering that your pussy needs him. He never yelled as if that made a difference. Quite clearly not about Harry Styles. He would do none of those things. <laughs> he would be the one telling you you should leave. That's what he'd be doing. I'm just gonna read... Um, something short and and I think my time is done I'm gonna read dog years which is a, a poem I read uh, I wrote for my dog Molly who died a few years ago um my delightful furry um I used to call her a furry speed bump because she never moved in her later years she just kind of sat in the middle of the room and was just in the way hoping for snacks dog years she snored in the night when you were alone together, lying on her back, four paws in the air. It was always a half whinny, and you thought she might have been dreaming about racing against a horse on cold sand. She loved the beach in winter. She loved the wind, sharp salt water needling her fur, and it only made her run faster. She loved the kelp bulbs that popped in her mouth. All that sand on the pads of her feet, perfect for racing dream horses or pretend day horses, or even the seagulls that dip so low. You haven't given away her bed or her food or looked through her bin of abandoned bones. The brown streak she smeared on the north wall of your stairwell is still there, two feet high. You sniffed it today and it smelled like rain-soaked fur, like the clumps of mud you used to wipe from her belly. But there was no judging her speed. She ran as fast as she could or she didn't run at all. She was fast or she was still and nothing in between. Soon didn't exist. It was and is only now. Twice. Mother, mistress, I ascended not through grace, but via debt. A trick of red knew its way all through me. How to cure him of the colic, the bedwet, the conquest, or the lack of consent. I haven't got it in my purse, in my nerve, or in a hospice of milk, a lactic dew stripping the patina from my femurs. Waitress, nurse, whore, had I another beginning, I'd have taken love down from its shelf and inserted it. The century that flattered me begged also in roses in spring. I am but a sinner ever retreating. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. And the word was final beyond a reasonable doubt. 
made, maiden, chrome. Breaking down before the reliquary age, I have this sense I am between genders in the west end of this dying city. To be a ram bucking in the stars, did I miscarry the accident? On my own release and flaunting recognizance, I palpated the grief, made a mask of all the features that are receding. The bones my dual nature disclosed amid a lawn of cosmos. Birth, marriage, grave. There is an amber colored skull in the painting called Vanitas that is my son. My son cannot speak because I have no son. I have a brother on the spectrum. He drives a rig hauling metals. He is my brother, but we do not share a father. It is impolite to speak of such things. My headstone could read that I was a creature unafraid to breathe these titles into speech. Address, occupation, age. Subpoena my belief. Love doesn't work here anymore. I lifted my face into distraction. I lifted my hair at its roots, my breasts with wires. When I dreamt the Indian agent, he was the accountant of persuasion. I let down my limbs and replicated. I do not know any other door through which to enter. Castigate my own body in service to the tyranny of will, which is no altar. There is no takeaway in the forest. Who will be invited to eat and devise a plot of land? Make this mantle disappear. The world is independent of my will. I've said this, nothing in me can ever truly pay the lease. She smells the air and breathes. Perfume from the neighbor's baskets of fresh peaches infiltrates, sorry, infiltrates her patio. Several small dogs pass in the lane, their leashes jangling, their rib cages flitting past fence slats. Young customers pool around the doors to the brewery, sharing a joint. She lifts her face toward your lilting, white-gray arms, dear Birch, foraging for emotional logic. She senses her shored-up, accusatory stance toward R, toward her stated plans to have whatever sexual activity she wishes. Her hands fidget as if the blood is moving improperly. She knows she is treating R as though she's disloyal and unethical, but R has never said anything to deny what she wants. She just entered this bearing of feeling attachment and then feeling deferred of blaming R for her pain. Granted, R then began playing the part, seeming callous and absent. All that sounds so easy to defuse, but it isn't. There's a long, deep, she would even say pathological bearing in her toward recreating this scene of betrayal that places her and the lover in a heightened drama of deciding to continue or end the attachment. It's a hook, a V shape in an upper branch, a place for birds and squirrels to make noise, to vetch. Awake to streetcar and subway rail yard squeals that continue with cling clangs and oral squalor for long moments on end. It's a whistling as much as it is a dragging, an against grade hoisting and an intake of wheezed breath that doesn't stop, like a wind that begins to suck the object world into its vortex. And there the cicadas, there the exhaust fan like a box of stomach churn. And then late in the game, there the faint voices next door of the parents and babies and the miraculously articulate toddler in mourning discretion. All is set in place, all is buzzing in every direction. She is impatient though. She needs motion and to displace her mind with the upswing of going somewhere else, to be on the move, to slide away from the hard dock of these feelings for R, these recognitions of how what they shared is ending or is ended. She is disappointed. Now too, she wonders about how much the third anniversary of her mother's death has to do with today's process. There was the interim procedure of her cremation, which she could not bring herself to attend and which meant her sibling went as the only sentry. How could she have let family be alone in that? She was terrified of the fire, the image world of witnessing just a crate go into a mouth of flame. Maybe that's what the rail yard soundscape is, such an alchemy of watching the box that holds your mother's body be fed into fire. 
Anyway, she couldn't go. So her sibling went alone and reported back to her after that it had really happened and was done. Against that, losing R begins to feel inconsequential. Their entire acquaintance unfolded within just one year. She hadn't known her before. She was one of the persons to enter her life after her mother died. Even this seems to stun her like a hot jolt of venom from a garden's bug. A red welt begins, an urge to tear at the spot of skin suddenly visible against the field of the whole body. New people continue to arrive into a life after the most significant bodies, the ones that made life possible and accompanied have moved on. She wonders if she has yet said the thing to any of her three children that will work as a healing talisman after she is dead three years and they feel themselves to be broken at the edge of anyone new ever arriving in their future. My father is a good Christian man who speaks with the kind of grace that can rouse 300 souls, even during the pauses, even when he's taking a breath. breath. Cantonese slips on eloquence like a Changsam dress as it leaves his tongue. Have you ever seen a congregation inhale as one, straighten its shoulders like an orchestra brought to attention? My father has a voice like a train rushing headlong over the tracks near our church. My father's voice was made for the gavel. My father's voice gathers clouds. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. When I was a child, my father and I fought and my voice would cower. Play Peter, deny me though it loved me. My voice would get lost, never find its way out of the safety of my lips. My voice was not made for war. It had the shakes and a fear of crowds. Now, when I call upon my voice, I tell it this, let them hear me. I am my father's daughter. And at your best. It is Friday night and we are at home on the couch. Your head on my shoulder, a well-worn path. This is not the first time you have slowed my hours and yet how the seconds gasp to be doing nothing at all, but feeling the universe wax content in your breath. It is Saturday night, and we've left our other lovers in a lullaby moon that croons beneath a dusty frame, like a memory of the sun that offers no warmth. There is only the green of your eyes ringed with gold, as clear as a summer stream, and I feel as if I will never thirst again. It is Sunday morning and the spell remains unbroken. I trace you in what's left of stardust. Another leaf has burst forth from the English ivy. I can't remember when I gave the sun back his hours, but now I am at peace with the world and its unloveliness. Yes, I think I would be happy doing this every night of my life. And on the pop kind of train from Jen's earlier reading, uh, this one is called The Perfect Groupie. For a time I went to bed dreaming of boys. My first boy band was a tween age dream of ripped jeans, frosted tips, and too much hairspray pouting from my bedroom walls. I even had their sold out show on VHS Yes, this was how I would fast forward to my happily ever after. My first boy band was actually a man band. For a time I went to bed dreaming of five man boys named after Orlando, but not from Orlando. I still remember their favorite books, sports, pizza toppings. I studied Angel Fire fan sites the way we study what we want to become. My mother was so excited for me to act like a girl. For a time, I went to bed dreaming of boys, their hair, their clothes, their songs, 
their dances. They were the perfect blueprint for a little girl who longed to be a teenage heartthrob, the kind of girl a girl could love. The tannins have browned your double skin, your cowhide robe, your velvet heart, your handle, your pommel, the cruel knot at the bottom good for long range whipping, your two strands graceful, a denial, a DNA of violence, your slender arms foldable into switchblade elbows, fetchable from the bottom drawer upstairs, beside the thing stolen from me for taking the thing that wasn't mine. Next is called Grova. Uh, describes a phenomenon where you sometimes don't realize that you're despairing until someone points it out and then you fall. Grove. In black light, the forest is an eye white fishbone grave where bleached an all pupil in its dark and the curtains of the world do not hush the dial tone traffic. In black light, I asked for a diviner and one asked why I was sad. I was when I looked. Your molten said another, and I did when I looked. We will have questions. We will have questions about this in the morning. I present my skull as exhibit, observe the nuclear shadows inside, flat ground molars and devil's grin. What medallion was this for? Lonely brewmaster's nurse, an antidiluvian premonition for the world. If we're eaten as friends, can we swap stories over the cauldron? There's a brave figurine in there bobbing to the surface of a second round, shredding soup for morning or the sucker of spectators. The soldier base of his feet is the pocket watch of long campaigns. Not unlike birds, many before us have taken wire cutters to their feet to reverse crash from the slop, seaplane churning their arms for flight. I can tell you therefore, at last, I am upright only because if I ever lay down a minute, I may never rise. Quitters, who can neither shut their eyes tight nor open them wide, know to tamp the fission of unraveling thought till the end. We'll come to the finer points of escape, but tell me again why you made this war. Via negativa, a phrase I've somehow never said aloud before. So I don't even know if that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> um, the 15 year abacus, a rosary of flint faces and an inverted road. Jonah, personal patron, pray for me. You brother of cowards and fugitives, well digger who struck a bedrock of scorpions every time. I too have encountered a rising tide of what could be water if it wasn't paralyzing me from the feet up. It's that venom for the black market, the good stuff I move in lucrative spreadsheets. I suspect I have no idea what I'm doing and these detours may kill me. But if I cross off every wrong road, my tally may pave a final one for me. And last is called Continental Want. Ayo is our two-lane mancala, remove seeds, count seeds, plant, capture children of a black Atlantic. We are the boarding pass pre-break, ambitious, amphibious on either side, manacled to exile, the random rulership of chance and the tartan memory of chain link fences, our office coffee pot black, but offshore labor in the morning. If Ayo is joy, then we wish, Ayo Akari, that the brown thumb of travel be unable to wilt us for the roulette of passport control to dispense enough joy into arm bowl hands, ballast to forge the oaths they put all we wanted behind. <laughs>